Uh, Chief Judge, may I open court? Please, thank you, Ann. Oyez, oyez, oyez. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeal for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. Good morning, Case Count. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ann, sorry. Case number 19-3045, United States of America versus Manuel D. Reynoso, appellant. Mr. Mammon for the appellant, Mr. Goodhand for the appellate. Good morning, counsel. Uh, Mr. Mammon, when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. I am Nathan Mammon, uh, appearing on behalf of Manuel Reynoso. While our briefs identify multiple errors that occurred in Mr. Reynoso's case, I'd like today to focus on two issues that we submit require a new trial. First, that the district court failed to instruct the jury that it must find Reynoso knew he had the status of having been convicted of a crime punishable by more than a year in prison. Uh, and second, that the district court erred by allowing a key defense witness, uh, Val Rodriguez, to refuse to provide testimony for Reynoso in violation of Mr. Reynoso's Sixth Amendment right. First, the jury was I'd not to, instructed- to increase the volume a little bit for Mr. Mammon. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the jury was not instructed uh, that it must find Reynoso knew he could not possess a firearm as the Supreme Court held was required in Rehoff versus United States in 2019. Now, Rehoff was decided after Mr. Reynoso's uh, trial uh, and plain error review applies here. The government does not dispute that the first three prongs of plain error review are met. The only uh, question before the court is whether the court should recognize and, and grant relief for the error that it, it affects the fairness of the proceeding. And we submit it does. This case is different in one key respect from nearly all the cases that the government cites uh, where the courts concluded the Rehoff error did not affect the fairness now, of the trial. Before you get to the difference, all the cases the government cites, other circuits have decided there did have to be a showing of prejudice, essentially, didn't they? Or an effect. The other, other circuits have, have held in the, in the published decisions, there's actually a, a Rather than telling the reply brief, a Second Circuit unpublished decision uh, that found that there, there was, uh, similar to these facts, that there was not prejudice or there was no uh, showing that he, the defendant would have known. Uh, but the other cases that are cited in the briefs, uh, the courts of appeals have said that there, there must be some showing uh, or, or needs to be some evidence that the defendant um, will look at the record and see if the defendant should have known uh, that he had been serving yeah. or, or had been convicted of a crime carrying more than a year of prison. Yeah. Uh, but in those cases, uh, I think the key fact from those cases is that in, in all those cases, except one uh, that I'm aware of, the defendant actually had served multiple years in prison. Uh, well, here, so, here, the defendant had been sentenced to two five-year terms, had he not? Uh, two essentially five-year terms. He had been sentenced. Uh, both uh, one was suspended entirely. One was suspended uh, to be less than a year. Uh, so he served some months in, in prison. But he uh, was. But, not, but he was sentenced. He was in court and sentenced to more than a year. More than a year. It was suspended, but he was in fact sentenced to more than a year. Right. He, he did receive a sentence, a uh, suspended sentence, but a sentence to more than a year. Uh, yeah. But we don't have in this in case, uh, which also happens uh, in other cases, uh, that where there's evidence of what was said at the plea colloquy, uh, what was required before the court, the state courts could accept the guilty plea. Was well, we, know, we know that a judgment was entered of more than a year sentence, right? We do know that a uh, judgment was entered of, of more than a year, but the, mm -hmm. you know, again, part of the sentence or, or the majority of the sentence okay. was suspended. Thank you. Uh, but we don't know, you know what was uh, told to Mr. Renoso, how what, what he was instructed uh, as far as accepting the guilty plea, that he understood the ramifications. Again, facts that uh, if the court looks at the other courts of appeals, those are facts that the other courts of appeals found uh, significant in, in not recognizing uh, plain error of reef. Uh, and so we would submit on this record where we don't know, uh, we know that he didn't serve more than a year in prison. We don't have any evidence from any plea colloquies, any other statements on the record to indicate that Mr. Reynoso knew he had been convicted of a crime that carried a sentence more than a year. 
uh, when he practically had not spent a year in jail, uh, that the record, this record does not conclusively show uh, that he knew his status was such that he could not possess the firearm. So can I ask you a question about this? Um, I know you have your other issue you want to talk about too, but on this one, you framed it in part as a plain error question along the lines of what you just articulated. And then you also have a sufficiency claim that's Correct. associated with this. And on the sufficiency claim, it just seems a little bit odd to be talking about sufficiency when we're talking about an element that wasn't instructed to begin with because nobody even knew that it was an element at the time. At least nobody involved in this case knew it was an, an element at the time. And so uh, the Ninth Circuit has a decision that indicates that we don't think of that issue as a sufficiency issue because we base sufficiency analysis on the elements that were in fact given to the jury. And we ask whether the jury had sufficient evidence for which to find that the element was met. Um, here, you just can't even do that because, because nobody understood that Rahaf was going to come down and require a finding by the jury of knowledge of felon status. You know, I understand, I agree, and I think the sufficiency point ties in with, with the, the, the rehash error point of that the, there was no evidence. You, if you look at the jury, if the court is constrained by what was the jury record, the trial record. Uh, so I know courts of appeals have, uh, for the most part, concluded you could look beyond right. the record before the jury. But if you're constrained by what the record before the jury in determining whether uh, you could conclude that uh, he would have known of his status, uh, that record, there's, there's, you know, it's part of the plain error analysis as well, that there's insufficient evidence to include on that record that he would have known. Uh, right. So, and, so I think, I mean, I, I take your point that, you know, you would have a stronger argument if you're bound by the record that was submitted as opposed to whether you could look beyond the record. And let's just suppose, I know you disagree with this, but let's suppose for plain error purposes, we think you can look beyond the record and you can look to what the facts are in the world. And then for plain error purposes, that means you take into account some things that the jury wasn't confronted with. But for sufficiency purposes, you still can do that. And then so then you'd have your sufficiency claim, but in theory, but in fact, the, the sufficiency analysis seems like a mismatch here when you don't have a jury instructed on the element to begin with. Then it seems like you're back to plain error and you have your arguments on plain error. I'm not suggesting that you necessarily win or lose on those. I'm just wondering whether there's in fact a freestanding sufficiency claim that would give you the certainty of limiting things to the record presented to the jury, when here we're not even really talking about the normal sufficiency rubric because the element was just never given to the jury. The, uh, you know, I think this, they think, I think they, they, they do uh, dovetail together at some point okay. and, and it comes down to the sufficiency uh, to my point the sufficiency claim. Um, if the court is constrained by the record before the jury, uh, I, I don't know if it matters whether it's under plain air review or sufficiency, but it, it's, it's an added uh, sort of wrinkle on that question uh, of, you know, what the record, wh whether the court can, can conclude that the, there was evidence beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence before the jury. Uh, that he knew of his Got it. So the way it sounds like the way you're conceiving the sufficiency claim is it's piggybacking on the plain error claim, assuming that for plain error purposes, you're constrained to the record that was presented to the jury. Yeah, sure. All right. That's okay. a much better way of phrasing it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. If I can just say one quick minute on the uh, on the Sixth Amendment issue, uh, the, the, there was a witness, Val Rodriguez, who was undisputedly the, the key witness in this case, because I don't think there's any dispute that it was his gun. Uh, it, that he placed it in the car uh, and uh, that he didn't tell Mr. Reynoso that he placed it in the car. What um, do you see and, as the effect of the stipulation below as to what the testimony would have been from uh, Rodriguez? Well, uh, the effect of the stipulation is uh, Mr. Reynoso... Ha has this error, if any, been waived or forfeited by that? No, Your Honor. I, I don't believe that the, the error has been waived or forfeited because... Mr. Reynoso made clear multiple times that he intended to call. He subpoenaed Mr. Rodriguez, the district court, and made clear that he was pressuring or encouraging the, the parties to reach a stipulation. Uh, and the key parts come at uh, page 708, 709, 710 of the joint appendix, uh, where the, the district court said, look, I think he's clearly going to assert the fifth. I think he has Fifth Amendment uh, issues, um, with the, Mr. Rodriguez, Fifth Amendment issues with respect to cross-examination questions. And then posed it as, well, maybe you could get this evidence in through uh, hearsay exception, through uh, testimony of the law enforcement officers. Uh, 
And at that point, Mr. Renoso's trial counsel was left with really no choice of he could, I mean, he, I guess he could put all his eggs in the appellate basket and say, no, I want to call him. And the district court can, can refuse and, and conclude that Rodriguez could assert his, his privilege. Uh, or he could accept the half loaf that he, he was offered at that time to stipulating to this testimony. And so I also uh, believe that in the context of how this came about, uh, Mr. Reynoso certainly didn't say he was waiving his rights uh, to, to challenge this issue. Uh, and it, it, in the context of how this came about, I don't believe that it, it clearly indicates that he had an affirmative waiver of uh, this claim. So uh, just one question on that, uh, on that issue. There, there is this point at 720, the joint appendix, <laughs> where um, the witness's counsel said, I just want to confirm with the court that it's all right for the witness to be excused and for me to be excused at this point. And um, your client's counsel said, it's fine with the defense, your honor. It, it, At that yeah, point, so doesn't it, it seem like the, the defense counsel is saying that now that we have the stipulation, I'm fine with the defense, um, yeah. as the counsel put it, for the, for the witness to be excused? Your honor, I, the, certainly it would be nice if, if um, you know, we could, could have a clear objection on this point, but I think again, yeah. if the court looks at the context of how this came about, by that time, it, it was understood that Rodriguez would take the stand, assert his Fifth Amendment privilege. Uh, they'd agreed to a stipulation uh, on uh, you know, Fifth Amendment privilege, and presumably he wouldn't testify. Law enforcement officers would testify. They agreed to a stipulation that would cover what the law enforcement officers uh, would relay. Uh, and at that point, uh, as Mr. Renes's trial counsel said, "Look, I don't have any." You know, there's no purpose of bringing him to the stand just to assert the, the, the right. Uh, you know, except he, that he, he might have been, him. except that he, he might have been able to have, if he asserted the right, then there would have been a hearsay, an argument for admissible hearsay, would there not? At least an argument. That certainly was a discussion uh, throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, the government, government opposed that and said that. Now, now you were not hearsay. trial counsel, right? I was not trial counsel. Right. Good. Uh, thank you, Arsh. If no further questions, uh, we'd ask that the, the court uh, vacate and remand for a new trial. Thank you. We'll give you your time for rebuttal that you requested too, Mr. Mammon. Thank you. thank you. We'll hear from the government now. Mr. Goodhand. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court, David Goodhand for the United States. Um, taking the issues raised by the defendant in reverse order, um, turning first to the Fifth Amendment claim. The government uh, believes the record demonstrates a, a waiver um, here. Uh, this was a knowing waiver. It was a voluntary waiver. Turning first to the question of voluntary, I know my opponent has suggested the district court insisted that um, he accept the stipulation. Um, the record bespeaks uh, the opposite. The district court twice asked, emphasis on asked, um, if the parties had talked about a stipulation. Um, the defendant twice indicated he would be, quote, glad to, uh, close quote, to uh, consider a stipulation. And then the, the defendant even set the terms of the stipulation um, by articulating the material facts that he wanted in the stipulation. And then um, this is at JA 17, 710, excuse me, said, um, as long as we are able to get that information before the jury, we would be fine. Um, and then the court adjourned the proceedings so the parties could discuss this. Um, the parties came back and the defendant declared, we do have an agreement in principle about a stipulation. That's a JA 717. So that's sort of the voluntary prong of waiver. The knowing prong that I know, again, my opponent has suggested um, was missing here. I think he has phrased it as the stipulation wasn't necessarily conditioned on a waiver of testimony. And again, the government would submit that the record bespeaks the opposite. In particular, um, a JA 708, um, the court asked, have you conferred, this is a quote, have you conferred about a stipulation as opposed to testimony, close quote. Um, the, the court also asked, um, in order to avoid the appellate issue, have you conferred about a stipulation? Those are both at JA 708. So to the extent that there's knowledge about both, I am taking the stipulation in lieu of testimony, that's answered by the JA 708 site. There's also even an indication that the, the defendant should have understood that he couldn't be doing what he's doing now. 
which is raising a, a series of claims relating to decisions and inquiries that the district court never had to make because of the stipulation. That is, to avoid the appellate issue, the court said, have you talked about a stipulation? And the, and the, the defendant agreed to that. Um, I would suggest, um, you know, look, we don't inv lightly invoke waiver. We understand that means that court that cuts off this court's consideration of the error as opposed to a forfeited claim. Um, so we don't lightly go down this road, but I would suggest this is a, 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 a good case for adhering to the waiver and enforcing it because the defendant, by all accounts, Mr. Ray, Mr. Rodriguez was actually in the courthouse. He was apparently in the hallway and the defendant never pursued whether or not he was indeed invoking. He never pursued a question by a question inquiry about the scope of the privilege that assuming it was invoked. Um, he never asked the court to do the waiver analysis once he uh, once that had been discussed. Um, and finally, he never, of course, asked the court to conduct the Pardo balancing, which he says was erroneous. So again, what we have here is this is why you have waiver. The defendant struck a pretty good bargain uh, with the government. Um, the government gave up its cross-examination rights. He got in the statements of, of Rodriguez um, and he put them before the jury in his closing argument. So in that respect, um, we think this is a good vehicle for enforcing the waiver that we have here, which was both knowing and voluntary. So there, there's um, nothing, there's, okay, before you go to your second issue, just yeah. add one question on this. There's nothing conceptually um, implausible about both taking the stipulation and also continuing to want to the witness to testify, right? I mean, in theory, uh, a defense counsel could certainly do that. They could say, look, I get it. I mean, it sounds to me like I may not get this testimony. So sure, I'll take the, I'll take the stipulation because that's all I can get. But I just want to make sure that everybody understands I'd rather have the witness. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's, I, I don't disagree with that for one moment. But what we have here is, is, is not that caveat. What we have here is the, the district court saying, we could resolve this with a stipulation as opposed to testimony. And the defendant agreeing to that, and as the, at, at, at the, the site that the, was raised when my opponent was at the podium, um, the, the, the defendant actually agreed to release the witness. So I don't disagree with the notion there's not an internal conflict there, but on this record, what we have is a fairly um, significant, robust waiver. Okay. Um, turning to the Rahaf uh, issue, a couple things first before I get into my argument. Um, I, I would note that uh, in the reply brief, the defendant has cited um, on, on several uh, occasions the Fourth Circuit's decision in Medley. I just wanted to make sure that the court understood that on November 12th, the Fourth Circuit vacated that decision, um, and they are now granted en banc review of the Medley decision. So a lot of the arguments relating to Rahaf um, in the context of, you know, what kind of error was this? Um, what prong of Olano do you, you do uh, access? The only authority that he has for a lot of these arguments is now uh, rests on a vacated uh, Fourth Circuit opinion, number one. Uh, number two, um, as to the instructional error, certainly it's, a, it's the defendant's burden to demonstrate um, that this, by not recognizing the error, this would undermine the integrity and the public reputa reputation of the judicial proceedings. As numerous courts have indicated, um, quite the opposite would be true if you were to recognize the error in a case like this. Old Chief constrains the government um, before Rahaf. That is, the government could not put in evidence relating to the depth and the details and um, the, the nature of a prior conviction. So the government, of course, held its hand in this case before Rahaf based on old chief. Now to come back around and suggest, well, um, the government didn't put into the record the requisite information, well, that, that would undermine the government submits the public reputation of proceedings. Um, and of course, this is easily resolved by just simply looking at the PSR here where the defendant three months before he was stopped on 17th street pled guilty to being a felon in possession in Maryland state court. Uh, 
So the suggestion that there's somehow a miscarriage of justice because he didn't understand his status, I would suggest, is belied by both the prior plea to a, being a felon in possession <laughs> coupled with, of course, in 2011, he pled guilty, he, excuse me, he was sentenced to two five-year terms. Um, I, I, okay. I don't have any further. I, I have a question for you on this, sure. which is uh, related to the question I asked Mr. Mammon. So um, they, the opening brief frames a, a, a kind of a, a related sufficiency challenge on this score. And the government didn't respond by saying that there's no such thing as a sufficiency challenge in this context. And um, first, I'm wondering why, because it, it's not clear to me that a sufficiency challenge makes sense where you have a jury that was never instructed on an element. And second, if you think that there is the possibility of a sufficiency challenge, I'm not sure I understand how the evidence could be deemed sufficient here because there was just no evidence introduced at trial about his knowledge. Turning to your honor's second point first, um, the, the several courts have been comfortable with the notion that the stipulation alone, when you're, if you're in the context of sufficiency, the only question is whether any reasonably ju any reasonable juror could conclude that he had knowledge of his status. And at least a couple courts have concluded that the stipulation itself would permit a reasonable juror to conclude that he had knowledge of his status. That is, he stipulated to the fact that he was indeed someone who had been convicted of a crime and been imprisoned by more yeah. than one year. I get we that, but, uh, but, it, ahead, but that, that would just mean that then Rahafe means nothing because the whole point of Rahafe, at least in the felon context, I understand that case came up with one of the other disabling um, statuses, but there's a difference between being a felon and knowing you're a felon. That's the premise of the entire decision. Sure. So what the stipulation tells you is that you were a felon. It doesn't tell you that the person knew that they were a felon. Now, I, 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 I take the point that most people, when they have a felony conviction, we can reliably assume that they know that they have a felony conviction. I understand that. But usually that's proved somehow. There's evidence submitted that at least somebody testifies or there's something that comes up that says, look, and people know they have a felony conviction, right? Yes. It, but there's, there's got to be some evidence that goes to that point as opposed to the mere fact of having been a felon. Otherwise, that element, the whole point of Rahafe in the felon context just goes away. I, I actually disagree with the, the court's okay. suggestion to the extent that, again, we're in the sufficiency context. Yeah. That's the template. Um, the, then the question becomes, is this a reasonable inference or is it based purely on speculation? And the question is, and the courts have said this, I'm sorry, I see my time's up. That's all right, you can, you can go. Um, the courts have said, it is a reasonable inference from the admission that you are indeed a person who has been convicted of a crime that, that is a felony. It's a reasonable inference for a jury to conclude from that alone that you would be a person who would know about that. It's an earth shattering notion that you would be a person who had been convicted and felony not know it. So, so if, the, if, if, do you think that it's a separate, it's a separate element to show that the defendant knew that he was a felon than that there, that he in fact was a felon? Yes. Then what, then in this case, for example, the, when the stipulations made about felon status, the jury's given the instruction that the evidence is relevant only to proving that the defendant was unlawfully in possession of a firearm as a person previously convicted of a crime punishable by imprisonment for a term exceeding one year. So the jury specifically told, you can only take this stipulation for purposes of felon status. It's not given the option of taking that into account for purposes of the mens rea. Now at the time, nobody knew that you even cared about that. I, I understand right. that, but that seems right. to go back to the question of whether there's such a thing as a sufficiency challenge in this context. But when the jury specifically told you can't take it into account for any other purpose, I don't know how we can say that the, it goes to sufficiency. Well, I, I understand. And of course, it, it is difficult to analyze this on the back end when Rahave comes down in the interim. And of course, that instruction. Uh, I would note this, however, um, we also pointed to the evasive conduct that the defendant um, signaled on the scene. Um, and again, right. I, I, I understand that. I mean, and there's other evidence that you could in theory point to. I mean, it's not the strongest evidence of knowledge of felon uh, status, there's obviously, there's much more that directly could have been done, but everybody, I, sure. I, I take the point that everybody's operating on a false premise here because nobody knew that you needed evidence. It's not as if yeah. the government couldn't come up with something that would have been completely satisfying had they right. known. It's just that we're operating in this strange world in which nobody yeah. even knew that this mattered. 
And, and, and I'll finish with this note, I, I'm over my time, but that circles back around to the core question that relating to the fourth prong of Olana, which is, are you doing a disservice to the public reputation of a judicial proceeding if you do not recognize the error? Um, and I would suggest, as many courts have found, the disservice would be done if you reversed here. Right. For plain error purposes, that might totally take the point. It gets yeah. confusing with sufficiency, but I think we, but we've been around that. But we, we appreciate your arguments. If the, my colleagues don't have any further questions for you. No questions. No. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. We would ask that you affirm the conviction below. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mammon, we'll give you your two minutes of rebuttal that you'd asked for. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, if I could start back with the Rehoff issue, and um, my uh, colleague on the other side mentioned uh, the Maryland offense and, and, and using that as, as further evidence that he would have known of the felony status. Uh, first, we don't actually know, and, and at the time that he was arrested and, and found with uh, this firearm in his car, uh, he had been pled guilty but hadn't been sentenced yet in, in Maryland. There's, there's a, a paucity of, of information on what that uh, Maryland offense was about. Uh, there's nothing uh, th that was put in the record. I've gone back and tried to figure out uh, the offense that he would have pled guilty to and the nature of it. We don't know the plea colloquy, but I can say based on my research that Maryland, again, this is that 922 doesn't require you to be convicted of a felony. 922 says you have to know your status that you've been convicted of a crime carrying a sentence of more than a year of imprisonment. Yeah. The Maryland offense that I think applies here uh, is one that requires a felony conviction uh, that, that could be under a state law felony, which can be, you know, include drug crimes, include it, the breadth of it, I guess, is unknown, that it's not coextensive of knowledge uh, and pleading guilty to knowledge you've been convicted of a felony, which he had in the Virginia State for, transfers over to, well, you also knew that you'd be convicted of a crime that carried a, more than a year in prison when he never served a, uh, more than a year in prison. So I, I think that's I think the Maryland uh, plea uh, was never relied on below, uh, but it's also, you know, doesn't get us there as far as proof that Mr. Reynoso knew of his status. Uh, regarding the medley, uh, my colleague points out, yes, the uh, uh, Fourth Circuit is, is hearing medley and bank, uh, I believe in January. Uh, but even on medley's facts, this case is much, much different. Uh, medley spent 16 years in prison uh, and so, you know, there's that fact that aligns with all the other circuits, which have, have looked at the length of time that a person actually spends in prison and saying, well, surely they know they were convicted of an offense, carried more than a year of prison when they served that. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, for time. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I see my time has expired. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to both counsel. And Mr. Mammon, you were appointed by the court to assist us in this matter, and the court appreciates your able assistance. Thank you, Your Honor. Case number 20-5006, Cause of Action Institute, Appellant versus Office of Management and Budget, White House, and United States Department of Agriculture. Mr. Mulvey for the Appellant, Mr. Fan for the Appellees. Good morning, Council. Mr. Mulvey, please proceed when you're ready. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Uh, my name is Ryan Mulvey, and I represent the Appellant, Cause of Action Institute. Uh, this case presents the question of whether internet browsing history records are subject to, uh, to are subject to agency con control and therefore disclosable under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, as this court explained in Judicial Watch v. Secret Service, the four-factor Burka test is the default standard for analyzing agency control in the usual case. And here, three of the four Burka factors cut strongly in favor of agency control. Uh, well, before you get to that, when you talk about how they cut strongly, you understand this is a de novo review. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. So we're not bound by the district court's conclusion that those three factors cut in your favor. That, that, that is I'm, true. I'm not at all sure that they do is the reason I'm raising that. So you may wish to tell us why this is, meets each of those factors. Don't, oh. don't assume that we're going to... Uh, calmly accept what the district judge found in your favor on, uh, on that. 
I accept that, Your Honor, and, and, and recognize it. Um, I, I think that the record supports the district court's conclusion as to, the, to, to three of the four factors, uh, and, and I do intend to in address those. So at least with respect to the first factor, uh, the intent to retain or re relinquish control. Uh, here, uh, it, the record is clear that the appellee agencies set retention setting uh, for browsing histories. With the record, the JA at least ambiguously contains language that persons using certain devices at least, and I think it probably extended everybody, could delete these sooner than the default, than the time set by the agency. The time That's set by the agency, there was an automatic deletion but some of them that didn't work on and they did, they did delete them manually. And as far as the record shows, anybody could delete them sooner than that time. That time was a, a drop dead time so that the agency wasn't retaining control. If the, uh, individual had the ability and the authority apparently to delete the browsing history sooner would, so there, the, you're right, Your Honor, that there is some ambiguity as to uh, the browsers on on cell phone devices, on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. I think it is clear, though, with respect to desktop computers, um, that there uh, the browsing settings were controlled by the agency and individual employees. As far as I can tell from the age from the record, and maybe I'm missing something, that was the time at which there was going to be an automatic deletion. It did not specify that the individual user could not manually delete uh, prior to the expiration of the automatic deletion. It, does it? Is no, no I, 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 there, there is some ambiguity there, but I think it's right to, to assume that within the retention period, an individual employee uh, could have the authority to manually delete a record. But I'm not sure that that's dispositive to, to intent to retain or relinquish control. It would certainly it, seem to weaken the force of your statement that clearly the agency had retained control, wouldn't it? Well, I think uh, an important consideration there uh, with respect to the retention settings is that an individual employee would not have authority to expand retention of, of, no, of, of, no, of the no, records. No, 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 no. That, that seems to be the record. But as far as we can tell from the record, he had the authority to delete. So doesn't that fly in the face of a conclusion that the agency retained all control over that uh, disposition. Not when you're talking about a record, I think, Your Honor, that isn't going to be subject to uh, something like the Federal Records Act. So the, this circuit ha has made clear in both Bureau of National Affairs and, and Consumer Federation of America that records management rules, um, including the disposition of a record, are not going to be dispositive to, to, to the control question whether a particular record is subject to the FOIA. FOIA's definition of an agency record and what would be subject to disclosure is broader than the definition of a federal record um, uh, in that respect. So long as the record is exists at the time a request is filed, then it, it, it could be subject um, it could be subject to, to disclosure. And again, it's true that the agency has given individual employees um, within the retention period, it seems, the authority to delete uh, individual browsing history entries. Um, but that's within the agency's authority to grant that discretion. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure that that destroys the overall intent. Um, there's, there's no reason to, that the agency couldn't have decided to deprive individual employees um, of their ability to, uh, to delete these records. If, and furthermore, there's, no, there's nothing in the record regarding whether or not the particular internet browsing history records at issue and the officials identified in Cause of Action Institute's requests have in fact attempted to, uh, to delete, uh, delete these files. Um, neither of the agencies make clear that they applied the control test to, to internet browsing history records that they actually reviewed. Um, and, and that's probably Oh, it looks like we lost a connection. Yeah, is it? I had been hearing noises in the background. Had you all been hearing heard, a, a, a ringing sound before he went? I only heard the chimes at 10 o'clock. I think there was. Oh, is a, that what that was? Uh, I believe okay. so. Uh, but, and do we have a way to, to bring back Mr. Mulvey? Uh, Chief Judge, I am going to oh. have him call him so he can participate by phone. Okay. Thank you.
He seems to be frozen in place. Okay. And Ann, we can stop the timer running if, if you have the ability to do that. I have a connection with Mr. Mulvey. He's going to be joining us by phone. I, I, I restarted my, my Zoom. I'm, I apologize for that. Okay. I'm not quite sure what happened, <laughs> uh, what happened there. Um, uh, I'm sorry, now I've, 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 I've forgotten where I was. You may want to move on to the other parts of the test anyway at this point. I'm, I'm not trying to take over, Keith. Sure, sure. no, I, I, I appreciate that, Your Honor. And I'm, I'm, uh, if there's any aspect of that that I, that I haven't covered, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer a follow-up question. Um, turning to the, to the second Burke factor, uh, the same agencies, OMB and USDA, uh, did concede that they have the ability to use uh, Internet browsing histories. And, and I question right. whether they use it within the terms of the act. The, the use they referred to making of it would be in the case of a disciplinary investigation or something, wasn't it, rather than in the, business, the normal business of the agency, right? Well, Your Honor... Uh Having a Zoom problem again. Yeah, um, maybe we can have Mr. Bulvey continue by telephone instead of by video if it's going to be uh, mm -hmm. a repeating issue. Chief Judge, I am calling Mr. Mulvey again. Thank you. Uh, it Chief Judge, uh, Mr. Mulvey is now, has now joined us by phone. Okay. okay. Please, Mr. Mulvey, if you're on, proceed to, with your response to Judge Nattel on the use question. Let me go just a little farther with what I was going to say about use. In terms of the use in the Burka analysis, if, for, by way of analogy, if somebody brought in in the physical world as opposed to the cyber world, a uh, some contraband, uh, uh, pornography, or something evidencing espionage, and the agency could certainly make use of that in a disciplinary or even criminal investigation, but that would not be used within the terms of the Burka analysis, would it? Uh, am I unmuted? Can you hear me, Your Honor? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I, well, I think it would, uh, uh, Your you Honor. You do think it um, would? Okay. Uh, it, it would be a it would be a separate question whether or not a, a, a record that's used in that way would then become exempt. Um, but whether or not a statutory exemption would apply, um, I think it, it is, is a secondary question. The foundational well, question. No, even is just for the Burka analysis, is that a use in the terms of what the court meant in the Burka analysis? I, 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 I think so. It, it, it is okay. not a, uh, a disciplinary investigation would be uh, an operation of, of the agency. Um, but so it, would case, it be yes, such I, as I, would make this a record of the agency? That, that's the question here is we're trying to determine whether this is a record of the agency. And if the only use the record going to make, the agency could ever make of it would be evidentiary use in a proceeding outside the agency's normal business. Uh, 
Is that what the Burka test was designed to ask as far as making this a record? Should that make it a record? Would that well, make a, a porn book that the employee brought in part of a record of the agency because they could use it against him in a disciplinary? Um, I, I, I think I think it could be. It's going to be a fact specific analysis. I think the, p part of the uh, difference with that example, Your Honor, is that all of the other uh, factors um, would would cut against agency control, and and you would also have a question as to whether uh, it has been obtained under the first prong of tax analysts. Um, here, uh, I mean, the government didn't really raise any dispute as to whether the first prong of tax analysts had been uh, uh, satisfied. Um, there's an acknowledgement, and the district court uh, uh, repeated this as well, that these records are created within the agency. In the but again, the this, is not, this is not a review for error. This is a de novo review we're making as to whether this is an agency record. And we're right, and I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that, Your Honor, but th th these records are created automatically in the course of agency employees undertaking their daily tasks. Um, what's the what's they're the created automatically on agency. What's the use that you're relying on here? Well, I think part of the uh, well, first of all, um, we would suggest that use needn't be dispositive. Um, so, if if three of the four Burka factors cut in favor of control. Um, then, then actual use under the third factor isn't going to be dispositive. There's also a background issue here, um, which pertains to the, the issue of discovery in that, um, as, as both uh, Appellant and Amicus have pointed out, there is nothing in the record about how the actual individual employees here, the officials identified in cause of actions request, use their internet browsing history records. That's completely absent, that, that, that sort of evidence from any of, of the declarations that were offered by the government. Um, why, um, and, and Mr. Mulvey, why is that the relevant inquiry as opposed to how the agency itself uses this record? Well, agencies, and I believe it was uh, uh, Judge Santel uh, put it this way in his opinion in, in CEI versus OSTP, an, an agency acts through its employees. Um, and I don't believe that there's any uh, case law in FOIA to suggest that we ought to distinguish between a record creator and others within the agency for the purposes of addressing actual use under the third Burka factor. You know, I mean, browser histories are, I think, in some ways, a bit unusual type of record, if they even are a record, right? Because a person makes internet searches for whatever purpose, um, you know, to find restaurant reservations, to research something they're working on. And the record itself is created, you know, by the browser or by the agency settings of the browser, right? It's not creation of a, of a record in the way as, say, writing a memo or something like that. I mean, do you think that makes a difference here? Well, I think it does, particularly for whether or not Bureau of National Affairs and the totality of the circumstances test uh, ought to be uh, the appropriate one. Now, of course, we argue that Burka, which is the default in this circuit, uh, is most appropriate. Um, but because the record is created automatically by an agency system, uh, the, the internet browser on an, in, on an agency computer, um, that sort of quintessential aspect of a personal record um, is totally absent, uh, namely that the record was um, created for the purpose of, of, of personal use. But we, already, so, but we already know, for example, from our cases that, uh, I mean, my law clerks have no, no idea what this even is, but I think some of us here can remember the days in which you got a note that told you that you got a phone call from a particular number and you needed to return that call. And that, that's not used for personal purposes, that's used for business purposes. And it is, in some physical sense, a record because it's a document that documents something that happened in the course of business. But we still don't consider that to be an agency record for purposes of FOIA. And it's hard for me no. to see how, if that's not an agency record, how a mere history that a person puts, that a browser puts together of sites that have been visited as to which there's no indication that the agency qua agency put, gives any use to that whatsoever nonetheless is a record. Well, I, I think two thoughts on that, Your Honor. First, with respect to the, to the, to the telephone message slips uh, and, the, and the case law in the BNA line of cases, um, that's only one aspect, right, that was considered 
to determine that those sorts of things are not uh, are not agency records uh, because the relevant test is totality. Right. So so I know that you got, right. But if you just focus on that one dimension and I know you've got your argument that there's other it's outweighed by other considerations. But on that one dimension, what's the comparison that helps you? Well, I mean, I think, again, you just have to look and we address this in our brief at the substance of, of what the telephone slip would be conveying as compared to what an Internet browsing history record would convey. Uh, it's not merely a URL. I mean, the fact that the URL is something that you can then access yourself, um, a requester who comes into, into can, you know, who gets a copy of the browsing history record, they're able to actually view the substance of the content that an individual agency employee um, was viewing, uh, presumably for work-related purposes. Um, and that's very different than just a telephone number. Um, of course, you could try to call a telephone number, but you don't get, you may not be assured a cooperation from the person who picks up the no, phone but, to but tell the, you what. Right, but don't you know, the, the, tel the, the slip tells you who called, right? Usually, yeah. It may, it may just tell you the phone number. It, I mean, it depends on what, that's going to be fact specific. It's going to depend on what the secretary or personal assistant was recording on, on the message slip. You probably um, don't ever remember again, getting those slips, but uh, some of us do. And they said, John Smith called you from such and such a number. Please return his call. It, it, uh, I never saw one that didn't have uh, similar information on it. And that's the way things used to be before there was such a thing as uh, email and texting and computers and back, back in the, Back in the last millennium. <laughs> sure. I, I, Could I, I ask you about point, the fourth uh, element? Could I ask you about the fourth element? What, how, in what way is this integrated into the record system or files of the, and that or or of apparently is something you considered a misstatement. I've forgotten which is correct. But anyhow, in what way is it integrated uh, in the fourth factor oh, well, of the analysis? I, I I think, Your Honor, in the same way that something like an, an email record would be uh, incorporated into agency Well, agency is this files. in the same database with anything else in the uh, agency system of files or files? Is it in the same database? Well, it, it, I mean, I, well, I, I want to just preface Doesn't the word response, integrated mean but, something more than just being located in the same office? That That fourth factor doesn't mean anything if we take your position that uh, just being there is enough, is it? Well, it's it's being merely present in the physical space of the office is is not going to be enough. But I, I think to use well, what uh, is it here well, that you have? Whoa, 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 whoa! What is it here that you have beyond that on the question of integration? Well, you have it. You have it on an agency computer. Uh, well, that's, that's the same thing as being in the other... same office, isn't it? Well, no, I, I mean, I think we can draw a comparison to uh, to Gallant v. NLRB, which, uh, Judge Santel, I, I think you, you wrote that opinion. There, I may the, have. I've what ended up being a personal time. record, the correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the the correspondence at issue, which deter was ended up being determined a personal record, was was on physical was a physical letter that was stored in a cubby hole in a credenza in the office, and I think that's entirely uh, disanalogous to uh, records that are saved on agency software on an agency computer and are accessible by other agency staff. Um, uh, both well, now what, the accessibility from other staff, the other accessibility from other staff is very limited, according to the, the JA, the record here. Uh, you had to be either sitting at the computer or at least to be used, signing on as the creator before you could have access, didn't you? You well, couldn't you just go to, anywhere in the to... office and, and, and hit a database and get the integrated information. You had to go. You, uh, so uh, that's what the what the what the government has argued, and that that it's, uh, but that's no different, I think, than in in most agencies with respect to the ability of IT staff, for example, to access the contents of, the, of a computer. Not all agencies have a magic button that allows them to access something like Microsoft Outlook email records, which I think we would all acknowledge. Um, are well established as agency records. Uh, some agencies, for example, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, at least previously, had to physically copy the hard drive of a computer uh, in order to search email in response to a FOIA request. Uh, 
Um, whether they've changed that uh, practice, I'm not sure. But um, I mean, that would seem to, uh, along your line of thinking, Your Honor, um, cut against integration. But I, I'm not sure that that makes sense as an outcome. So long as something is is on the agency computer um, and is something that could be accessed by others, uh, that that integration aspect of the fourth Berka factor um, uh, is met. Thank you, oh, Mr. Thank Roman, you. Let me, under, oh, please go, please, Judge oh, Rao. Sorry. Sorry. Um, under, I mean, under that reasoning, then is anything on a person's computer integrated into the agency's records? Just because it's on a computer, and so therefore you can go find it somewhere. I mean, is that is that sort of the implication of your argument? Would there be anything on a on an agency employee's computer that would not be an agency record? Well, I think that if you had something on the on the local drive, say on your desktop, for example, um, that could be that could be a. a a distinguishing element, right? A distinguishing fact. How, how um, could that be a distinguishing and, fact where the agency owns your computer and its hard drive? So you don't put it on the network, but you have it on your C drive. I mean, that that can't be the distinction. I mean, I think, again, it would be, it would be fact specific. And moreover, um, even if that were enough with respect to integration, all the other aspects uh, of the Burka factors, or if we're in DNA totality of the circumstances, all of the other uh, considerations about the creation, possession, control, and use of, of this record that's located, um, you know, say it's a, 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 a birthday card that you typed out and saved on your hard drive, all those other aspects are, are going to come into play, um, as well as the all important consideration that uh, you purposely created that record for personal purposes in a way that's abs that sort of aspect is absent from internet browsing history records. And moreover, looking at, um, at Kissinger, for example, um, and also CEI versus Office of Science and Technology Policy, the idea that you, the employee, have a superior claim of right over that record to call it your property, even though it's being used uh, in a minimus way by expending agency resources and stuff. That sort of consideration is completely absent from internet browsing history records. An employee or an official can't claim his internet browsing history records as his and walk out the door uh, as Secretary Kissinger did uh, with his notes uh, in Kissinger. Uh, that, that, so I think those sorts of considerations um, would, well, would, would... But then is the only reason the employee can't do that because the agency has a practice of capturing those browser histories? Well, uh, that, that may be I mean, be that one seems to be a big part of your argument. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and, more, and, and moreover, and this gets, I, I think, back to the first Burke factor, which I was discussing with Judge Santel at the outset. Um, it, that also speaks to intent re to retain control. Here we had the agencies doubling the retention period from the defaults. They obviously understood that there was some importance um, to internet browsing history records to keep them within the agency, um, at least for some period of time. Uh, uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have done anything. Uh, they would have just kept the automatic retention settings, the ones that were set by the manufacturers. Instead, they took the proactive step of expanding, more than doubling, those retention periods. Okay. I want to make sure my colleagues don't have any further questions for you at this time. And we'll... Uh, Thank you, Your we'll... Honor. We, we would ask that this circuit reverse the district court and hold that uh, the records at issue are subject to agency to, uh, control and disclosure under FOIA. Thank you, Mr. Mulvey. We'll give you a, a bit of time for rebuttal, but we'll hear from the government now. Uh, Mr. Fan. Uh, good morning, your honors. May it please the court, uh, Dennis Fan, on behalf of the United States. I just wanted to pick up on one discussion that uh, they had about the yellow telephone slips that were the subject of Bureau of National Affairs. This case really is even easier than Bureau of National Affairs along three metrics. And I kind of want to point these out in turn. They have to do with what my colleague noted are the sort of creation, possession, and use of a record that this court has often found significant. Um, as you know, Bureau of National Affairs, the documents there were created solely as a, a personal convenience. They were kept sometimes, uh, but often thrown away, and they weren't really used in the course of any agency decision-making. 
here, the internet browsing histories are created solely as a technological byproduct of using the internet. If you're using the internet at home on your web browser, you're going to create a web browsing history. If you use it at work, you create a web browsing history. In the same way, they're routinely deleted. And in fact, um, there are deletion periods in which they have to be deleted after a certain amount of time with respect to browsing histories. And finally, in terms of use, um, browsing histories are far less useful than the telephone slips were. I mean, if you, you could go your entire career within a government agency without opening up your browsing history. Back in the day, if you didn't have telephone slips, I mean, you couldn't really run an agency without them because you wouldn't know who, so, you know, who called, when they had called, how to get them you know, call back. And you would be sitting at your phone all day, essentially waiting for uh, the next call to come in. So along each of those metrics, uh, this case really is easier creation, uh, retention, and use. This case is far easier than Bureau of National Affairs. And I think uh, that case and that binding circuit precedent easily covers the situation that we have here. So I have, I have a question. Um, do you start out your brief by saying because officials in a technical sense cause the creation of browsing history simply by using their browsers and then go on to the second aspect of the tax analysts framework? And I'm just wondering why it's self-evident under the first prong of the tax analysts framework for a couple of reasons. I mean, you might well say, look, we had an easier argument under the second prong, and that's why we focus on that. I, I understand that as a matter of argumentation, but in terms of what the, the conceptual reality of what we're dealing with for purposes of our analysis, uh, is it right that a browsing history, a, co a couple of questions. First, is a browsing history a record that always exists as opposed to one that's created upon request? In which event, that's the creation of a record rather than the existence of a record. And FOIA doesn't cover creation of new records. It covers existence of pre-existing records. And the second somewhat related question is, is the browsing history something that exists? I know, it's, you, I know you can find it on a computer, on a government computer. But does the browsing history exist in the government? Or is it something that the browser company has and then the, 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 and then the particular user can then just commission when they want to. So it's like an offsite, you know, something that's kept somewhere else, mm -hmm. but can be brought into the government's purview upon request. I think the best way to think about this, if you remember that there were the best analogy for this, if you think back in the day of uh, before there were computers and you went to a library and you had to get one of those index cards with the short stubby pencils and write down reference call numbers and you like went through the catalogs, you're like, what's this book? What's that other book? And you kind of scroll down a few numbers. Uh, that's the best way to think about this. I mean, this is kind of you having some type of notation that says, hey, I went to Google yesterday and you write down Google as the, as the URL. So um, they are I, 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 I got to say, uh, th this, this is metaphysical and I'm not, I don't, I don't, yeah. I'm not sure that it's gonna, ultimately matter to the, to the disposition of the case. But even on that analogy, you're the one who's writing down the things that you're going to ask to be found in the stacks, right? And that's, but it would be different if you just said to a librarian, here's the five books I want. And then you ask the librarian, oh, what are the five books I want? I wanted. And then the librarian, he says, oh, I wrote them down. Here's what, here's what I wrote down. Mm -hmm. Those are two yeah, different things. Yeah, that's that is that is entirely right. I mean, the the browser histories do exist. I guess maybe taking your questions more directly, the browser histories do exist on government devices and on government computers. That's sort of the way they function. They don't exist off site in some ether or in the cloud. They're not on the cloud um, somewhere. <laughs> which I don't know how to treat that, but you know. The, and the second <laughs> answer is, uh, in terms of how they're created, you're right. I mean that your computers create these and they create these to make themselves more functional so that when you type in geo into the search bar, it says, you know, wow, judge Srinivasan goes to Google a lot. So we'll autofill, you know, Google into the search bar. Um, you could, I mean, not on many government devices because most government devices, you know, your ability to change settings is highly constrained. Uh, but on a lot of devices, you could turn off your browsing history. You could have no browsing history. You could, you know, 
function perfectly well even without one. Um, so in that sense, uh, it's there's some very small element of choice, and you know we didn't argue below that these weren't created or obtained in a technical sense, um, and we didn't press that argument, which is why we haven't done so here. But I certainly understand the distinction where you have documents that somehow sort of just, as you might think of them, appear onto your computer. I mean, computers kind of run all sorts of things on the background that might create files or create different versions of things that you don't even know about and you have no choice about. But I think that only underscores why the agencies aren't really exercising any degree of control here in the relevant sense. Mr. Fan, um, I was interested in this argument about whether um, the district court should have dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction here. And in, in going through the cases, I mean, there seems to be some tension in how we talk about this, um, you know, establishing that these are agency records as part of the jurisdictional inquiry or not. Um, because it's, there are cases that suggest it goes to jurisdiction, but then of course we have that footnote in text analysts which say, well, you know, the government has the burden of showing that it is um, not an agency record. So I'm wondering how should we think about that issue? How should we reconcile those um, tensions? Yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, when exactly this sort of becomes jurisdictional or not. I mean, if um, you asked an agency for all the documents in the possession of some private company, I mean, I'm sure we would say, like, that's not a FOIA request at all. Like, what you've provided doesn't sound like a FOIA request. That sounds like you want the agency to go subpoena some private company. Um, but I don't think it matters here and I don't think the court needs to decide because ultimately if it's not an agency record uh, there's both no cause of action or claim under FOIA and there's no jurisdiction so I think those issues sort of collapse because FOIA at least only provides yeah, jurisdiction maybe for it collapses FOIA in this case but conceptually it could certainly make a difference over the run of cases um, and if it is a jurisdictional inquiry, then it would be the case that the plaintiff has to demonstrate that it's an agency record, right? Because yeah, the plaintiff it, has the obligation of demonstrating jurisdiction. Yeah, generally, uh, I think that's right. And again, I, I think the only cases it does matter are the sort of, you know, the cases that I can think of as are absurd cases, right? Where you say, like, I want the documents of the State Department of Education and you file a FOIA request with the U.S. Department of Education, we might say that, well, that's not a FOIA request at all because you haven't even asked an agency for something that would be an agency record. And if they attempted to sue on the basis of that, we might say, well, that there's no FOIA request that could be the basis of jurisdiction. Um, and in any event, I, like I said, I, I think this case at least is fact specific enough where it needs to be resolved um, as a factual matter on declarations, and that's what the district court did. So I, I think, at least in this case, as your honor mentioned, doesn't the difference between whether it's distinguishable? Well, I'm sorry, Judge Rao. I, no, I, no, go ahead. I cut you? Um, I'm on, on the same on the mm -hmm. same wavelength. Uh, whether it's jurisdictional or not would go to whether we have to notice it on our own, wouldn't it? So, for example, if you had a case in which the government, for whatever reason, didn't make an argument that the requested matter didn't qualify as an agency record, but then just went right to, straight to the exemptions and said, don't worry about it because it fits squarely within an exemption. Then if it goes to jurisdiction, then we on appeal would have to actually address whether it's an agency record or not. We couldn't just go to the exemption question. Right. That is that is entirely correct. You wouldn't be able to go directly to the exemption question, though. Presumably, you could also say that there's no cause of action for something that um, but the existence or non-existence of a cause of action is usually a merits question, not a jurisdictional right. question, isn't it? No, that, that that's entirely right. And I, I guess I'm just assuming that the government in most of those cases would make some type of argument there that there is no cause of action and thus that totally collapses with whatever jurisdictional inquiry that might arise in these circumstances. And like I said, I don't think that this case is the one to resolve that sort of question. I don't think I there's just... really many cases that that question would have have any significance. I guess I think I, I, I disagree that the, that whether it is a jurisdictional inquiry is only important in the outlandish cases. Because if something is jurisdictional, it's important in every case, 
right? So, so this, this argument that you're making that, um, you know, well, of course it would only matter in the outlandish case. I don't, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't understand that argument. I understand you may yeah. not want us to reach that question in this case, um, but um, I, I guess I don't understand like the government's position um, to say, you know, jurisdiction only matters in outlandish cases. Yeah, and I, I think some of this has to do with functionally how a FOIA request is processed. I mean, you're gonna look at the sort of face of a FOIA request, and if it doesn't even sound like it's a real FOIA request, for some real things that are agency records, then the agency um, is well within its rights to say, look, you know, you don't, th this isn't anything we can do anything about. This isn't a request that we can provide records or even do a search on. And if they sue, then we would uh, provide, you know, we would then say perhaps that there's no jurisdiction over that suit because there's no FOIA request for something that on its face looks like an agency record. Um, but in this case, I, I think, you know, understanding what the browsing histories are depends necessarily on these sort of declarations about what the browsers do and how they function. Um, and in that sense, it, it collapses in cases like these um, where there's no cause of action because there's no agency record for sure. It, it, so you th are there cases in which the proper disposition is 12b1 rather than 12b6? Yeah, there's there's been suggestions that, you know, for there to be jurisdiction, it needs to be a record by the agency um, in sort of that numerical sense. I'm not sure um, whether those cases really mean jurisdiction in the strict sense. There are cases where the question has arisen as to whether something is an agency or not. The reference presidential offices that things that are not agencies would not be within that would be jurisdictional, would it not? That's that's absolutely right, Your Honor. If you like, uh, like I mentioned, if you you know sent a FOIA request to like a State Department of Education under the Federal Freedom of Information Act, and they said, "Well, we're not really an agency," um, that would certainly jurisdictional and that's what i mean when i say white house counsel's it, office uh, white house counsel's the presidential office. offices that are not agencies so that would not be that would be jurisdictional uh an attempt to get judicial or congressional records likewise were not agencies so that would be jurisdictional would it not that that could be jurisdictional your honor and it could be i mean it depends on where those records are housed in some circumstances but it could also be jurisdictional for example if there was an agency that just isn't subject to FOIA at all, um, in which Congress had otherwise exempted them altogether from FOIA and you sent them a FOIA request for agency records, they could say, well, we're not one of the relevant agencies with respect to FOIA. Um, and so there are, I, maybe, you know, maybe I've overstated it a bit. I mean, there could be cases where the jurisdictional inquiry matters to some degree, but in this case, the real question is, are these agency records? and um, well, they it, simply aren't, and so both. It's an interesting are argument because if it is juris, you admit that it's jurisdictional whether something is an agency or not, and there are government entities that are not agencies within the meaning of FOIA. Mm -hmm. Then shouldn't it also be jurisdictional whether something is a record, right? Because that term goes together, agency record. It's not so. If the agency component of it is jurisdictional, why wouldn't the record component of it also be jurisdictional? Um. I mean, we're, we'd be happy if this court affirmed on the basis that there was no jurisdiction in district court. Um, you know, the question of whether something is an agency tends to be a little bit more clean cut than some of the questions of whether something is a record. We think the question of whether there's a record in this case in particular happens to be fairly um, straightforward and decided based on Bureau of National Affairs. Um, but I see my time has elapsed, and unless there are further questions, um, uh, we urge you to affirm. Thank you, Mr. Fan. Unless my have colleagues have further questions for you, we'll, we'll uh, hear from Mr. Mulvey for his rebuttal. Mr. Mulvey, we'll give you two minutes for rebuttal. And we've lost him again. <laughs> 
Uh, no, I, I'm back. I, I just need to unmute myself, Your Honor. Um, uh, thank you. I, I, I would like to, to, to add w one point on, on the question of jurisdiction. Uh, Judge Rao, you, you had mentioned that um, at least to subject matter jurisdiction, the question of whether a record is an agency record, um, if, if that's jurisdictional, uh, or rather if, if the question of whether an agent, uh, an, a government entity is an agency may be just as jurisdictional as the question of an agency record. If you look at Kissinger, which is where this three-part uh, aspect of jurisdiction is kind of spelled out, um, you, you would have to add to that list the question of whether a, of a record has been unlawfully withheld, whether or not an exemption has been properly applied. Um, that would need to be jurisdictional as well. And if that were the case, it would throw all of FOIA um, uh, into, into an, an entire mess because it would destroy, like that. you mentioned the, the footnote in tax analysts, that an agency bears the burden of demonstrating uh, that, it, that it, it has lawfully withheld the records. All of that would be thrown into disarray if uh, we were... It, dealing with 12b1 because the burden would be on a plaintiff requester to demonstrate um at the outset uh that not only is the the entity in receipt of a FOIA request an agency for purposes of FOIA and that it has control over the records um but that a, a particular statutory exemption has or has not been uh, been properly applied and and I don't think that makes much sense I think a lot of the confusion um, that has uh, arisen, and I'm, I'm not quite sure why the government in this case uh, decided to move to dismiss under 12b1, because I, I, there is not one single example uh, in, in, in this circuit I, that I can think of, uh, of, a, of a case dealing with the question of whether an entity is subject to the FOIA or whether records are um, agency records that's been decided um, in terms of subject matter jurisdiction. It's always a merits question. Um, a lot of it stems from just ambiguity uh, in, in the language of the FOIA itself. It uses the term jurisdiction, but as the district court here, uh, and as the district court in cause of action versus internal revenue service, which is an opinion I would uh, recommend um, uh, to the panel here to review for this question of jurisdiction, it's used ambiguously. Um, and appellant's position and the decision of the court below um, was that jurisdiction here really doesn't mean the power of the court to hear a well-pleaded FOIA claim, um, but rather uh, jurisdiction here speaks to the, the limits, uh, to the limits of the court's remedial power to provide a certain type of relief. So if a record isn't an agency record or if an entity isn't an agency, the court can't order disclosure um, of, of anything. Okay. Uh, Th turning to well, thank you, Mr. Mulvey. Thank thank you. Let me let me make sure my um, colleagues don't have further questions for you. I think we've gone quite far in the. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, okay. Thank Mr. You, Mulvey. Thank you, Mr. Fan. We'll take this case under submission. Case number 20-1060 et al. Leggett and Platt, Inc. Petitioner versus National Labor Relations Board. Mr. Harper for Petitioner Leggett and Platt, Inc. Mr. Solem for Petitioner Keith Purvis. Ms. Sheehy for the respondent. Morning, Council. Mr. Harper, please proceed when you're ready. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is John Harper, and together with co-counsel Arthur Carter, we represent Petitioner Leggett and Platt in this matter. The National Labor Relations Board's critical error in this case is its insistence that the Levitt's last in time rule should apply, resulting in the imposition of a bargaining order, even though it held in Johnson Controls 368 NLRB number 20, that the last in time rule failed to satisfy the board's statutory goals of ensuring employee free choice and maintaining labor relations stability. As this court has repeatedly recognized in SCOMAS and Lee Lumber and elsewhere, 
employee free choice is a core principle of the National Labor Relations Act. I want to discuss three primary points this morning. First, the board should have applied Johnson controls retroactively to the facts of this case. Second, this court should simply deny enforcement to the board's order rather than remand it for a third bite at the apple. And third, in the alternative, the court should deny enforcement to the NLRB's bargaining order and remand the case under Skomas v. Sausalito, or Skomas of Sausalito versus NLRB. Um, Leggett will stand on this briefing with respect to the substantial evidence points it made regarding the union's petition and the alleged unlawful assistance to a subsequent decertification petition but I'm happy to answer questions on those matters. First, turning to the issue of whether Johnson controls should have been applied retroactively. The board recognized in its decision below and has recognized elsewhere, retroactive application is the formal practice unless manifest injustice would result. In Johnson controls, just as in this case, the Levitt's last in time rule would have resulted in, a, in the imposition of a bargaining order, except that in Johnson controls, the board decided to overrule the Levitt's last in time rule, implement a new standard and apply that standard retroactively. Um, it applied the standard retroactively in Johnson controls because and I quote, the union's ability to rely on its dual signer evidence is the source of the very problems our new standard is meant to cure. So its loss is simply the inevitable consequence of curing the mischief the pre-existing law created. The board and Johnson controls also recognized the Levitt's last in time standard had been subject to repeated criticism, including criticism by this court and SCOMAS. And so too here, the union is relying on the very same sort of dual signer evidence as is the board, which creates the very same mischief and the very same criticism of the Levitt's last in time rule. Thus the board is really trying to have it both ways. Either the Levitt's last in time rule is inconsistent with the board's statutory mandate or it is not. If it is, then that rule should have been applied consistently here because the operative facts are the same. Both cases involved employee submission of a majority petition to employer saying that they no longer wanted union representation. In both cases, the employer relied on that petition to tell the union it would withdraw recognition from the union when the bargaining agreement expired. But Mr. Harper, could you, could you just say um, a little bit more specifically what you think the problem is with the NLRB um, not applying this retroactive, retroactively. Do you think that it is arbitrary, that it is contrary to law, an abuse of discretion? You know, what, what standard are you applying for that? I, I think it is, it is an arbitrary and capricious decision. The board does have discretion to determine retroactivity mm -hmm. uh, in its cases. Um, here, the board abused its discretion and acted arbitrarily in failing to apply Johnson Controls retroactively. Um, and you see that because the facts of Johnson Controls and of this case are virtually the same in terms of the operative facts, number one. And number two, taking into account the board's explanation as to why it refused to apply Johnson Controls retroactively um, simply does not support the, the result. And for that, I mean, the board relied on two reasons why it was not going to apply Johnson Controls retroactively in this case. First, it said that it had- um, Could you speak up a little bit, Mr. Harper? Of course. Possibly? Well, Thank yes, you. Yes. Of course, is that better? Yes. All right. Um, and I would say, the, let me back up. The board's discretion is not unlimited. It may not act in a way that is arbitrary, capricious, or otherwise not in accordance with law. And so we would say that the board's decision not to apply Johnson Controls retroactively is arbitrary, is capricious, and is contrary to the law that it set forth in Johnson Controls. And it gave two reasons why it did not believe um, Johnson Controls should apply retroactively in this case. First, it said that it had institutional reasons as to why Johnson Controls should not apply retroactively, but it never identified those institutional reasons. It simply said they existed. Second, it said that it, went, it expected prompt compliance with its bargaining orders um, and that the parties should have been bargaining here rather than Leggett and Platt exercising its statutory right to appeal. Um, this reason has several problems. First, it ignores that board orders are not self-enforcing. Um, if the board wants to have an enforceable order, um, it needs to come to this court and Leggett and Platt had a right to appeal under 10F, which Leggett exercised that right. Second, do, do you think, Mr. Harper, that the bargaining order here was um, 
an abuse of discretion after um, this court's decision in SCOMAS? I believe that the bargaining order was an abuse of discretion after this court's decision in SCOMAS. But I also believe that under Johnson Controls, um, the bargaining order is really irrelevant because Johnson Controls should have applied at the board level. And at that board level, the board should have dismissed the unfair labor practice charge the one out of the way that Johnson Controls um, reads and is applied. And so I don't believe that this court even needs to get to the bargaining order issue, which is why it's an alternative argument for us. But should the court reach it, um, we believe that SCOMAS is dispositive here on nearly similar facts um, and that the bargaining order under the reasoning of SCOMAS is an abuse of discretion um, for the reasons stated there. Turning, turning back to the Johnson controls and why the board's reasoning as to no um, retroactivity is really um, can't withstand reason. Um, it does, just as your honor, Judge Ralph mentioned, it ignores the fact that SCOMAS was in existence the very first time that the board decided this case. And it was in existence the second time the board decided this case. And Johnson controls relied on this court's decision in SCOMAS and stating that the Levitt's last in time rule was inconsistent with the, um, with the statutory requirements of ensuring employee free choice and maintaining stable relations. Um, speak next, up again, board, please, counsel. I'm sorry? You keep dropping your voice. If you could speak up again, you were doing fine after Judge Brown asked you to, but you're, you're dropping again. Could you speak uh, up? I, I apologize. I'm still getting used to the, uh, the Zoom format, so I will, okay. I, will, I will continue speaking up. Okay. Um, the, the board also argues that not complying with its bargaining order in this case somehow disrupts the, the bargaining relationship between the parties. But as the board recognized in Johnson Controls, what disrupts the bargaining relationship between the parties is the Levitt's last in time rule that allows an employer like Leggett, that allowed an employer like Johnson Controls to unwittingly withdraw recognition while the union was sitting on evidence of a reacquired majority status um, and that is what caused the disruption, not a failure to comply with the board's remedial order in this case. Um, next, the board says that the parties could have been bargaining and they could have reached an agreement um, here rather than Leggett pursuing its right to appeal. And this really points out a significant problem with the board's orders here. It defended its bargaining order the first time around on the grounds that that bargaining order only was imposed for a reasonable amount of time and thus had a limited impact on employee free choice under the act. But now it says that what the party should have done was bargain and enter into a collective bargaining agreement, which would have required, which would have imposed this union on employees for an extended period of time, up to three years. And that is the very problem with bargaining orders that this court has repeatedly identified, including identified in SCOMAS. Um, so in conclusion, the board, we believe, is simply trying to have it both ways here. On the one hand, it says the Levitt's last in time rule does not comply with the statutory mandates. On the other hand, it says compliance with its bargaining order here, which is in violation of SCOMAS and which is in violation of its own decision in Johnson Controls, also comports with the statutory mandates and it fails to adequately explain its reasons. We believe that this decision is arbitrary and capricious and against extant law as set forth in Johnson Controls. Turning to my next point, and I see I'm running short of time, um, we believe that the proper course here is for the court to deny enforcement and not remand this case. Um, we believe that the outcome here is foreordained under the rule of Johnson Controls. And in this sort of situation, as the Supreme Court has stated in NRB v. Wyman Gordon, cited in our materials, the court has the discretion to simply deny enforcement to the board's order rather than remand this to the, the board for a third time. So it can sit there for Lord knows how long um, while the parties wait and wait and wait for a resolution here. Uh, we believe that this court has the discretion to deny, deny enforcement and bring an end to this matter. I see my time is, is what, what out. should we do then with the other Lester, if you would, uh, ULPs that, uh, are discussed in the briefs. Yep. So the only other found ULP in this matter is an alleged unlawful assistance to a second decertification petition that was filed in June of 2017. And as we argued in the briefs, we do not believe that the board's finding on that is supported by substantial evidence. What we have there is we have a, a human resources manager interacting with a new employee and pointing that new employee 
to the decertification petition or the evidence is that the human resources manager pointed the employee to the decertification petition or to be introduced to a supervisor the employee didn't hear anything as to why he was being pointed to the decertification petitioner and the way that the board got to a violation there was that it imposed an adverse inference on Leggett because it failed to ask the decertification petitioner about what was going on but respectfully it's not Leggett's burden of proof to prove an unfair labor practice violation against itself the decertification petitioner was equally available to both parties and the counsel for the general counsel failed to call and ask him questions even though he was pregnant okay thank you can I ask you just one quick question about the the remedy so I don't want to presuppose anything but on your argument about the remedy if we deny enforcement of the board's order then is not the natural upshot of that that we remand anyway doesn't that usually happen or am I wrong about that so we believe that if if you remand the case the only the only remand would be with a direction to dismiss the unfair labor practice charge the simple denial of enforcement stating that the board cannot enforce its order the direction would simply be to remand for dismissal right so then what what you're talking about is the direction that's given not the not the denial of enforcement because the denial of enforcement itself doesn't dictate what happens to the case before the agency when it goes back or am I missing I think your honor if you deny enforcement to the board's order that becomes the law of the case in view of the board and so you know whether you remand with a direction to dismiss or whether you just deny enforcement we believe the denial of enforcement would end the matter technically there are two different cases here aren't there I mean there's your your petition for review and the board's petition for enforcement so you want to win on your petition for review not just on the denial of enforcement don't you that's correct we would like the court to grant our petition for review and your petition for review and that that would take care of the question of remand we would not have any remand anything to remand there the denial of enforcement is a different question and without 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 with you winning on the first one and again I'm not trying to assume something but if you win then there's nothing for the board to be remanded about we just deny the remand that deny the order that's that's our position yes your honor thank you okay okay thank you counsel mr. solemn thank you may it please the court Aaron Solemn on behalf of petitioner Keith Purvis and if I may I'd like to reserve at least one minute for rebuttal what happened in this case is proof that judge Millett was right when she noted the board lacks any discernible intervention standards the onus of the bargaining order falls on my client and not on the employer a bargaining order prevents my client from having his election petition processed and it will eventually lead to the decertification petitions dismissal so when confronted with the similar situation in novellus the NLRB is ALJ and ALJ at the NLRB granted a limited intervention to employees to oppose a bargaining order and on appeal the board upheld the intervention yet the board cannot adequately explain why intervention was granted in that case and a host of others that we've cited in our case such as Johnson controls Avenue dental Renaissance Hotel and it cannot do so it was intervention was denied in this case and it can't do so because as judge Millett noted there's no standard now the board makes three principal arguments on intervention first it claims the board is wide discretion to grant or deny second it argues Purvis had nothing to add to the hearing and third it argues that any interest Purvis has can be vindicated through the decertification process each of these arguments fail in turn first well the board unquestionably has discretion it can't act arbitrarily and the board's intervention decisions are arbitrary because ALJ's grant or deny intervention in typically similar cases and those interventions are then rubber stamped by the board as I said you see this in novellus Johnson controls New England confectionery all the cases we've cited in our brief and so the standard of granting intervention on it well you know when you see it basis is a failure of the board to carry out its own functions and as judge Millett noted the board has to issue some reliable consistent standard now the board claims in its brief that its standard is readily discernible but this is belied by the fact that the board's newly discovered standard bears little relation to the ALJ's own intervention decision the ALJ denied intervention here because he found Purvis lacked a 
an interest in the ULP proceedings because he could go to the decertification proceedings. But now the board claims that its intervention standard concerns whether the proposed intervener will be able to proffer additional facts. And so if this standard was actually discernible, it wouldn't have only been applied by the ALJ. It would be applied in every single intervention decision. And even for the case that the board cites for this proposition, United Dairy Farmers, if you look at footnote three, which talks about intervention, it isn't talking about a factual standard first, it's talking about an interest standard. And in that case, they simply found the employers who attempted to intervene in that ULP case didn't have an interest under the statute. And then it went on to address whether they would have even added additional facts had they had an interest. And so in reality, what you see is these ad hoc determinations, that's no standard at all. And so in any event, I think Purvis did have facts to add here. And we don't accept that standard, but it ignores that the ALJ credited Rose Berry's testimony um, because nobody asked Purvis about his interactions with uh, Stephen Day, with the employer's agent. And Rose Berry's testimony was the linchpin upon which the ALJ held leg as impermissibly aided Purvis's second decertification petition. And so the board overall also overlooks that Levitz is unlike other ULP cases. The Levitt standard necessarily requires um, employees to be not only fact witnesses, but the whole test is whether the employees themselves objectively wanted the union gone. And Levitt says, this is a question of employees section seven rights. So it makes conceptual sense to say, if Levitz is about employees section seven rights, those employees should have the ability to retain their own counsel and participate in the hearing to the extent Levitz is necessary. Now, I'm running short on time, um, and I just want to say that Purvis has an interest in opposing a bargaining order precisely because of this Kafkaesque process where the board says, you have a right to an election, but that election is dependent upon what happens in this case. So the board can't have it both ways. They can't say, we want a bargaining order that prevents an election, an election that's been prevented now for three years. And at the same time, they say, well, you can go get an election, but you can't. <laughs> And so ultimately what the board even says in its remedial order when they refuse to reply Johnson controls, they say the party should have been bargaining and they could have come to an agreement. But that agreement would block any election for up to three years. So in reality, what you have is three years without an election. Then you have additional time for bargaining under a bargaining order. And then three years after that, uh, if they come to an agreement before that the time period runs out on the bargaining order, then we're blocked for an additional three years up to seven years. Uh, to, so to say that we don't have an interest in this case, I think is just wrong. Now, uh, does, I'm out of time. Does the court have any questions? I don't believe so. Uh, doesn't look like it. So thank you, Mr. Solon. Okay, thank you. We'll hear from the board council now, Ms. Sheehy. Good morning, your honors. Barbara Sheehy for the National Labor Relations Board. Is my volume okay? I'm also new to this. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, if you don't, obviously just let me know and I'll see if I can move closer to the microphone. So I'm gonna start with um, the remedial order in this case, the affirmative bargaining order, because that seemed to be gaining a little uh, attention in opposing counsel's argument. So I'd like to start there. And we start from the premise that this is not SCOMAs. SCOMAs was- Can you, if, if, uh, I'm sorry, I'd, um, just at least for my purposes, and, and if my colleagues would like to hear argument on that, that's, I don't wanna deter you, but I'd like to hear about the retroactivity issue about Johnson Controls, rather than presuming that we're at the affirmative bargaining order Okay. Remedy phase. Yeah. Okay. Um, so and, yeah, and, happy, I'm happy to start with retroactivity. So yeah, and my and my main my main question is just to channel the inquiry a little bit is. Let's just assume that the board does get to define, get at least has discretion to determine when decisions are retroactive and when they're not, and let's just assume further that that the board could in theory decide that Johnson controls, even though it frames it as retroactive to this case is in all in this case and all pending cases, it could decide in some other pending case that even though Johnson Controls applied retroactively in John Johnson Controls itself and framed it as applying to pending cases, there could be some pending cases as to which Johnson Controls wouldn't be applied retroactively and the board has discretion to do that. Sorry, can I just ask, when you say pending cases, do you mean pending at the administrative level, just to make sure I understand the question, or is it pending in any phase? Well, so so that's a question. I mean, to me, when we talk about pending cases, it just means all pending cases, but let's just, I, I'll even assume further, that one could draw a distinction between cases that are pending before the agency and pe that are pending in, uh, on judicial review. I'll, 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 I'll go there too. But still, there has to be a reason to treat a case differently than another case in which retroactive treatment was uh, granted. And as I, 
as I read the board's order in this case, the reason basically boils down to there's some language about institutional interests. I think that just that just points the reader towards what comes next because institutional interest isn't self-defining. Sure, and, I agree that there's overlap. Absolutely. Right. And so the, and then what comes next is basically basically it's a it's a time question about, you know, it's been it's been some time and the parties should have been bargaining. But all that happened was the employer took and filed a petition for review. Right. And at, at that point, I don't I don't I don't know what uh, an employer is supposed to do, particularly when they actually have. A, but Johnson Controls itself, the board says, you know, there were some serious questions about an affirmative bargaining order. That's not to say that you necessarily win or lose on that, but it's just to say that there's a serious question on it. Then on all the employer has done is filed a petition for review. And it's just hard for me to understand why the mere act of filing a petition for review puts this case on a different footing than Johnson Control it's, itself. Now, there may be other reasons why it's on a different footing, but there's nothing in the board's order that spells out anything further than that. Respectfully, I think the board does, and it could be that it's in the footnote. So there's the footnote also in the denial of the motion for reconsideration. So there's the supplemental order the December order 2019, and there's also the denial of the motion for reconsideration. And the board does more than just say they should have been bargaining for six months. In fact, the board points out that it, it deliberately issued Leggett and Platt knowing that Johnson Controls was pending. Johnson Controls didn't issue for six months Afterward, so this is a strange retroactivity case in the sense it's not that the board deliberate. Not- when they say there was a deliberate decision, the decision is just based on the fact that there were not three votes to overturn Levitt's in this case. Is that the institutional reason? Uh, the that's the. The board cites to the fact, yes, that there was not, and I believe that's in the original, not the not the denial of the motion for reconsideration. That had to do with the issuance of, yes, Leggett and Platt, not an institutional reason for to deny retroactivity. There's a distinction there, I think, on the institutional reasons. Is, is that part of the reason to deny retroactivity for Leggett and Platt, though? I'm sorry, is, is what? Is the, the fact that they did not have, that there were not three board members for that position in that's not, Platt. That's not identified by the board as one of the reasons that it's not applying retroactivity. When the board refers to the lack of three board members or a full board at the time, um, three members to overturn, it's referring to the deliberate decision to issue Leggett and Platt, the way that Leggett and Platt came. But the, but but the, but the, but the deliberate fact. reason is about the recusal. Yeah. Like there's no other deliberate reason from, from what I can see from the order, there's nothing deliberate other than the recusal question. Yeah. I, I don't know. There's nothing else in the decision, but I, I don't know inst- internally. Well, let's put it this way. If, if we take the recusal, it sounds to me like you're not relying on the recusal. So if we take the recusal out of play, then what was meant by deliberate determination? Yeah. Is that it, the board was aware Deliberate in the sense that it was aware that Johnson Controls was in the pipeline. The, the board would certainly know that a similar pending case. In fact, it was in all likelihood on briefing at the same time or in draft. Sure, but but I, I don't. I, but I, I, I don't. Sure. There has to be some reason underlying. I mean, the board can't. They're both pending before the board. They have case A and case B. The fact that the board says, you know what, case A came up first, but we decided that we were going to issue the decision in case B second. Right, Therefore. And- and that's We're not going to apply A retroactively to B. Right. And that's because I think your honor, <laughs> your honors are right. That's but they issued the decision, the first one, the Leggett and Platt case. They issued that because of the recusal. Emmanuel, member Emmanuel could not participate in the first case. Right. But so the recusal, however, is not a reason. So once Johnson Controls is decided and Johnson Controls says that it will have retroactive application, the earlier recusal cannot. I mean, I don't see how that could be a reason for the agency not to apply retroactivity to Leggett and Platt. Well, if you're, there, there were other reasons, though, cited by the board. It wasn't just that. They did also acknowledge, right, that the bargaining order had been in effect for six months. But that's going to be that's, true for any party yeah. that has a bargaining order and yeah. chooses to appeal. That is not a reason particular or deliberately considered about Leggett and Platt. I think what's significant in that sense, though, is that the board also recognizes that to allow a decision 
that it is issued, knowingly issued, knowing that there's the possible, everybody briefed in this case and they briefed in Johnson Controls reversing the last in time. Yes, but the everybody knew it was on the table. The, the, the uh, knowing, it's really interesting that you keep saying knowing because the only, you're not distinguishing the two cases on their facts or on how Johnson Controls would apply. The only thing that is knowing in the sense in which you say, or unless you can point to something else, is the recusal. Like you haven't pointed to any other distinction about why Leggett and Platt was deliberately or knowingly um, decided in the way that it was. And I, but I, I think what's unusual in this case on the retroactivity doctrine, right, is that the board had already decided the case. So even the courts recognize, or even the courts recognize that that's an unusual, in fact, as far as I know, there isn't precedent for a retroactivity doctrine where an administrative decision has already issued with, with the board issued a decision in the case, as opposed to cases that hadn't been issued before. So I do think the board is due some deference under the statute to determine, listen, we don't wanna incentivize delay to the extent that we issue an order. And there could be another case that everybody's familiar with because sometimes the board puts out a call for briefing that once they put out that call, if I'm on the receipt, I'm on the losing end of a decision, they don't want to incentivize delay, hoping that the case will be overturned. So I do think the board- did I, I, don't I, I, I don't understand, I don't understand that, that point about not incentivizing delay. The only delay you're talking about here is the time it takes to pursue their legal rights. What, what in the world do you mean by incentivizing delay? There, We're going to decide against you delay, because you're out there appealing from what, where we decided against you. Incentivizing delay in the sense that if you, the, the delay, they're absent Johnson controls, nobody knows whether, so Johnson controls pending and in in, before the board, nobody knows whether the employer would have actually gone to the bargaining table. So incentivizing in the sense that if I otherwise would voluntarily comply, because everybody knows the board's orders are not self-enforcing, if I was otherwise as an employer willing to comply, but I now know that there is a pending case before the board that will turn the law around, then I may absolutely file a petition for review. And there are no timelines either in the statute. Sure, but that, that's just a, I, I, I gotta say, I don't, I, don't, I don't begin to understand how that, ways in the board's favor here. Did Johnson yeah. Controls come up before the board first? Or did, did Leggett come up before the board first? I believe, and I'll correct myself later if this is wrong, I believe Johnson Controls was in the pipeline first. I, I, I think that's my so, best So Johnson Control comes up, that's what that was my understanding too. So Johnson Control comes yeah. up first, and the way you're describing it, the board can make an intentional decision to issue Leggett first, even though it came up second. And the byproduct of the intentional decision to go out of order, if you took them in order, if you did FIFO, then you, if you did first in, first out, then you would issue Johnson Control first. But then the board says, you know what? I want Leggett to actually have a bargaining order. So I'm going to go ahead and take them out of turn and issue Leggett first. And then I'm going to issue Johnson Controls that takes the substantive foundation out from under the bargaining order in Leggett. But because I decided deliberately that I was going to issue Leggett first, now I can just say that I'm going to set the law right in Johnson Control, the law right the way the board sees it. I'm not suggesting that I think the law is necessarily right or wrong. I just that's the way the board has seen it, that sets the law in a particular direction in Johnson Controls. And then I'm just going to decide that because I deliberately did Leggett first, even though it came up second, then Johnson Controls doesn't apply to Leggett. That doesn't paint a particularly sympathetic portrayal in my mind on the board. I don't, I'm not quite sure why they have the discretion to do that. I think as Judge Rao was saying, there has to be some reason for treating the two cases differently other than the board deliberately decided to issue one before the other, because that's not a reason. And it's not the recusal. I can understand why you're not relying on the recusal because that doesn't seem like it would be a reason either. So it seems to me you're right not to rely on that either. But there has to be something that says, even though I applied case B retroactively, I'm not gonna apply pending case A retroactively other than I deliberately decided that I wanted to issue A first because that doesn't seem like a reason to treat them differently. Right, and I, I don't know that that, again, I'm not involved in sort of in the internal workings on the board side. I'm not, I, I think that's unfair to say that the board was sort of involved in those mechanics. Outwardly, it, it may- No, I'm, I, I'm not suggesting, I'm taking you at face value on your board, argument because yeah. I'm not seeing what the reason is for treating the two cases differently that is manifested in the board's order, other than a statement that there's institutional reasons, which as we all agree, that just refers to what comes next. 
a statement about something deliberate, which also I think doesn't, it's not self-defining. I don't understand what's being deliberate other than what you're saying, which is they deliberately decided to issue one decision before the other. That's fine. I, of course, you can make a deliberate decision to issue one decision before the other. But if the board, but they're both pending, then there has to be a reason for treating the two cases differently. I don't understand what that reason is just by use of the word deliberate. Then that takes you to the third thing, which is that this was pending for a while and they could have been bargaining. As to that, all the employer did, and I think that's what you're left with. And as to that, all the employer did was take an appeal. Uh, not an appeal, I'm sorry, they filed a petition for review in a context in which I, I don't know what the, I, I could even conceive of a situation, there may be some situation out there where the employer engaged in some kind of conduct that was dilatory, including in the context of taking a petition for review. I, I'm not sure what that would be, but you know, the board would be free to say that in the particular circumstances, there's some dilatory conduct here that justifies differential treatment. But here, the only conduct is filing a petition for review, which was entirely within its rights, especially because in Johnson Controls itself, the board says that there's grounds for calling into question whether an affirmative bargaining order is warranted given the DC Circus decision in SCOMAS. What, what's the board left with on treating the cases differently? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to answer the question because you've walked through all the reasons that the board that, that the board has given. But, but, but again, I would remind the court, I think that the board is entitled to some deference. And it's not just that the reasons that it articulated were just, you know, we think it was deliberate or we think this. They've tried to tie, the board tries to tie it to its statutory obligations. And so they've tried to explain, the board has exp tried to explain why it is that in this case, they decided on the particular facts of this case that right, it, so I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying to be as deferential as I possibly can be to the board. Honestly, I am. I know. And all I'm hearing is conclusory, you're, you're left with the board order that you're trying to defend. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not blaming you, but I'm just saying all we're left with is the reasons that were given in the board's order. And they don't feel like they have anything underneath them because institutional, we all agree, doesn't say anything. Deliberate, I don't understand what that says because it only means you deliberately decided one before the other. There's nothing underneath that. Then you're left with the time period, which that in theory could be something. But here, the time period isn't anything other than taking the petition for review. Am I, as to that, am I right or wrong about that? Is there something else that I'm missing about what is involved in the time period? So, so the time period, I think the board looked at it more holistically in the sense that, so certainly as the facts played out here, yes, this employer, and I'm going to go back to something I think I've met with resistance before, but I'll try again. The employer here certainly took the appeal, but I think the board is more focused on in the abstract, it expects voluntary compliance with its orders and it doesn't want the, an employer or a union for that matter, to game the system and not comply in the hopes that there will it's be- It's not supposed to legally expect compliance with its orders. It's supposed to legally expect compliance or petition. Uh, you're, you're not gaining anything by expressing that expectation on the board's part, I don't think. I don't think it's unfair to say that the board has a reasonable expectation of voluntary compliance. And in fact, in when the right to petition for review exists, you yeah. think you, you should be able to expect where they're going to comply rather than petition? I don't think that a reasonable expectation necessarily negates an employer's right to file a petition for you. I can have, or the board can have that reasonable expectation while fully recognizing, as it must, an employer's ability to take the appeal. But in large measure, not a lot, not in, but as a percentage, not a lot of our cases actually do come to the court. I feel like Maybe I'm here often enough, but it is, as it relates to all the decisions and orders that issue, there is a- Okay, uh, but even on that, even if we assume all of that, and I, again, I am trying to be as deferential to the board as possible given our court's decisions on that issue. Johnson Control says, this is the board, and Johnson Control says, in light of the DC Circuit's opinion in SCOMAS, the enforceability of an affirmative bargaining order issued under pre-existing law would be in serious doubt. So that so two responses to that. The, the first is I'm not sure now that um, Wyman and Gordon has issued. I'm not sure that the board was right. For Wyman Gordon, we sent the 28J letter in on that, where an affirmative bargaining order did actually survive judicial review in that case. And so that was the first point I was making. Oh, and second, the second thing I wanted to say was that's a comment then on the affirmative bargaining order. That's a comment on the remedial order, not on 
the violation. So the retroactivity applies to the first in line and obviously affected the order itself, the remedial order, because if you undo it, the ability of the union, as Gabor did in Johnson Controls, to rehabilitate support, if you... If but, you I, but, I, but in terms of filing a petition for review, didn't the employer file a petition for review in, in which one of the issues raised was the, the um, enforceability of the affirmative bargaining order? Certainly, based on SCOMAs, absolutely based right. on SCOMAs. And that's something that the board itself says would be in serious doubt. Now, that's not to say, you're, of course, that doesn't mean insuperable doubt. I mean, it, it's possible that uh, an employer can win, and I'm not necessarily saying whether the employer wins or doesn't on this case, but in terms of understanding, the board's understanding of why an employer would file a petition for review in this case, the board itself said that the issue is in serious doubt in this context after SCOMAs. The, yeah, I, I can't deny what the board says in Johnson Control, right. So then in, in terms of whether the board can expect, I mean, you're, you've made an argument that the board can expect that its orders are going to be complied with. And I'm just, what I'm suggesting is the board itself has understands that in, on this exact issue, the affirmative bargaining order in this case, even if a board can generally, generally be seen to expect that its orders are going to be complied with, and even putting to one side that there's a statutory entitlement to file a petition for review, on this petition for review, it's an issue as to which the board itself says there's serious doubt. And again, I think I would fall back on the notion that in deciding and looking at its statutory rights and its institutional reasons, the board is looking more in the abstract. It doesn't want to encourage in any circumstance, whether in this particular case that didn't factor in as heavily as it would in a, in a different case, the board is saying that retroactivity here undermines its ability to, ex or undermines its reasonable expectation of compliance. Okay. So I would say it's more in the abstract. I see. Let me ask my colleagues if they have any further questions. If uh... I do have just one other question. I mean, the board obviously has some discretion with respect to whether it applies its decisions retroactively. Um, but in a context like this where the board and Johnson Control specifically decides that its decision will apply retroactively, what is the scope of the board's discretion to make a different decision? Right, that's a wonderful question. And I don't know, I mean, we looked at what the law is and the retroactivity doctrine speaks as Judge Rao just said, as you just said, it speaks first, right, to the board's uh, discretion to decide the matter in the first instance. But then beyond that, even this court has recognized, and I think it's the um, commercial uh, union case, I believe, or United Commercial Workers, um, that the standard is sort of all over the map, even in this circuit, as to what, how does this court look at that determination? And in fact, but even in those cases where the court, this court has recognized that it's, there's some level of discretion, because one of the components of the manifest injustice test looks at the statutory considerations. So in that regard, as we wrote in our brief, we maintain that the board is entitled to some discretion. And on top of that, I would add that I, and I, I tried to say this earlier, I don't know if I made the point clear though, but it's an unusual case in that traditionally the retroactivity cases that come up on appeal where the court, any court is reviewing an agency's retroactivity decision. It's in, it's as if it's the Johnson controls decision, not, so meaning retroactivity is normally challenged in the very decision where the board has said, or the other an agency has said, this is retroactive in all, pen this case and all pending cases. And I think it's a different proposition to say that this is, this is a decision that already issued six months before the retroactivity decision came out. So I think in that regard, the board here, I think that's why you saw them speaking to institutional reasons and relying on that context to, 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 um, to deny retroactivity in this case. And I think that counsels in further of a higher level of deference than in a traditional retroactivity case, which would be, like I said, if Johnson controls were to come up before the court and the issue of retroactivity in the actual dispute of the, of the case where that decision issued, I think it would be a different proposition. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sheehy. I don't believe I have further questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harper, we'll give you your two minutes that you asked for on rebuttal. 
Thank you, Your Honors. Um, very briefly, uh, Ms. Sheehy mentioned the, this court's recent Wyman-Gordon decision, but that decision is very distinguishable for the reasons that Leggett and Platt stated in the 28-J letter. Yeah, you speak up just a little please. bit? Yep, sorry. Um, Ms. Sheehy mentioned the Wyman-Gordon decision that this court recently issued, but that issue or that decision is distinguishable for the reasons that Leggett and Platt stated in its 28-J letter. Among other things, the petition in that case was defective. The petition in this case was not defective. Um, secondly, Ms. Sheehy mentioned that this case was an unusual case because it had already been decided when the retroactivity matter was decided. Um, a case that we cited in our motion for reconsideration to the board on this very issue um, was the board's decision in Williams Energy Co. 340 NLRB 764, where the Williams case was pending before the Fifth Circuit. The board was in the process of deciding a case that was going to reverse precedent underlying the Williams case. The board asked for remand of the Williams case, decided the new case reversing precedent, and then applied the new precedent in the Williams case even though the board had decided the Williams case previously. So um, that case was cited to the NLRB in our motion for reconsideration, and we would submit it to you for consideration with respect to the board's point. And with that, unless the court has any other questions for me, um, I will cede the remainder of my time, request that the court grant Leggett's petition and deny the board's. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harper. Uh, Mr. Solomon, you did have one minute. I don't think your issue came up in the course of arguments, but you're welcome to take your one minute if you'd like. Um, just to address two quick topics that I think came up in the course of uh, all of the discussions today. Uh, first, to piggyback on what Mr. Harper said, uh, Wyman Gordon is extremely distinguishable for the reasons we both stated in our responses. But also, it's interesting that uh, Judge Henderson was on the panel and also wrote SCOMAs. I think uh, the court would be surprised to learn that it overruled SCOMA sub silencio um, uh, because uh, Wyman is just completely distinguishable. Um, second of all, I wanted to discuss uh, the issue of remand. Uh, the court's mostly focused on the Johnson Controls issue, and we're agnostic about that because whether or not there's an election because there can't be a bargaining order or there's an election because uh, the union moves for it under Johnson Controls possibly, uh, it doesn't matter either way, potato, potato. But the question is, is what to do with this case? And in our opinion, we think a remand is the best issue uh, to deal with this uh, if it is not dismissed because the board has to fashion some other remedy. And as this court noted in SCOMAs, an election is the appropriate remedy under SCOMAs. And this case is on all four with SCOMAs. So thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank, thank you, you to all counsel. We'll take this case under submission. This honorable court is now adjourned until Thursday, December 3rd at 9.30 a.m.